The Google Pixel 6 has been out for three months and I fully switched away from a lifetime of iPhone for the very first time to this Google Pixel 6 Pro. And I also ditched the Apple Watch and replaced it again for the first time, the Samsung Galaxy Watch 4. So three months later, here we are. And in this video, I'm gonna fill you in on how it's been to go from an iPhone and the whole like Apple ecosystem to Android, only carrying around one phone, the Google Pixel 6 Pro. If you are new here then, hi, my name is Pete and this video is a continuation from a number of other videos around switching, well, to the Google's Pixel 6 Pro and switching to Android in general. So if you are an Apple user and like myself, you're kind of thinking about switching away from Apple because things have just kind of got a bit stale with the iPhone lately, then consider subscribing. It really helps me out and means I can continue making these kind of videos for you. Now I'm gonna split this into two parts. Things I like about the Pixel and things that I don't like. And when I say the Pixel, I'm also gonna combine this with the Galaxy Watch 4 because as far as I'm concerned, the Galaxy Watch 4 is one of the best Android watches you can get right now. So first, let's get going with what I like about this Google Android Pixely thing. Now, many of these things I probably moaned about when I first picked up an Android phone, not necessarily just the Pixel. So how do I feel about them three months in? Well, to be honest, I now feel totally different. Minor things like the torch not being a quick tap away on the phone screen and instead being like a swipe down and a tap instead. That I got used to pretty quickly and it's fine. The notifications also really, really great. Now, first off, I thought they weren't as good as an iPhone, but actually on both phones now, you can fairly granularly customize the notifications. But Android and the Pixel takes the edge just because you can customize everything just that little bit beyond what you can do on the iPhone. Now, customization is undoubtedly better than the iPhone here. And for the iPhone users actually going to a Pixel, it's a pretty good experience with just the stock Android launcher. And you can install other Android launchers, which are basically like diff skins and themes, which unlock more customizations. But for most iPhone users, the Pixel will actually be quite familiar for those switching away from Apple. Now, the home screen customization I like because you aren't forced to fill down from like the top to bottom like you do on iPhone. You can basically place icons wherever you like and they stay there. You can have the whole top part of your phone completely empty if you wish. Now, this is something that I know we've all had issues with before on the iPhone where you move just one thing and then the whole screen messes up and gets in the wrong place. Now, social media apps on the Pixel also a very good experience, though in some apps like Facebook, the navigation moves from the top instead of the bottom. Uh, that can be quite confusing if you've been using an iPhone for the last like 15 years. But again, something that you get used to pretty quickly. I would also say that for the most part, the app experience on the Pixel has been pretty good as well. There's a good selection of apps. Not everything I've been able to find a direct replacement for. I think it's just the calendar app, which is the only one I still kind of stuck with, but I'm getting on okay with just the stock Google calendar. I'm just missing like the Apple calendar part of it. But for everything else, and with only a few minor exceptions, I've been able to find an Android app to replace them. Now the general UI and navigation also, as long as you switch on the gesture navigation, it's basically the same as the iPhone. The difference I had to get used to was just swiping up to get to your apps rather than swiping down. Now I found myself preferring a cleaner home screen. I mean, this probably doesn't really look much like a cleaner home screen to you, but to me it is. But all of the gestures are still basically the same as the iPhone, so you have no problems finding your way around to whatever you wanna do. Speaking of which, I love the settings are actually searchable. And if you don't know where a setting is, you can search for it and it will take you to the right page and then flash to show you where you need to go so you learn how to find it yourself in the future. That's quite a neat feature. Now, voice dictation, and I know I've said this in a few videos, like every video, but the voice dictation on the Pixel is incredibly accurate. It can add in all of the natural punctuation, even emojis, without you having to type the message out yourself. I can't actually recall ever really having any issues with it, unlike when you actually try and use Siri and basically have to just give up and write the message out by hand anyway. And not just the voice dictation, but I've actually really enjoyed the Google Assistant overall. Just simple questions that I can ask and get an answer actually out of Google compared to Siri, where all it would do is be like, well, here's the web page with the information. Go look for yourself. Now, my only other comment around the voice dictation is that I probably use it less than I thought I would. I think it's only when you start using something daily and with people like around you and specifically kids that you realize you can't use it lots of the time, either due to noise or getting weird looks from people or just not wanting everybody to hear every message you're sending. But when I did use it, incredibly useful. The camera, I do think that I actually prefer the camera on the Pixel. It is like, it's punchy, it's colorful, images are saturated, and actually the four times optical lens on this Pixel 6 Pro has come into handy at various like Christmas and birthday parties where you're not taking, you know, more posed shots. 
and I find that if I took a shot on both the iPhone and the Pixel, the chances are I'd actually want to upload the Pixel photo onto my social media and not the iPhone photo. But that again is just more of a personal preference and there's a whole camera comparison which I did with these two phones, which I'll link up here and down below this video. So go and watch that one if you want to. Now I didn't notice any odd issues when uploading images through social media. I'll be honest, I'm not a huge pixel peeper. I don't start pinching and zooming in on like every photo to see what's going on. So my experience of using social media apps and uploading images through those apps has been well, basically the same as on iPhone. Now, Wi-Fi connectivity, strange one to mention, but the Pixel was so much better and faster at connecting to my home Wi-Fi than my iPhone. Well, how do I know this? Because when I drive home, I get out of my car, walk to the front door, get my iPhone out to like close the garage and let myself in, well, the iPhone normally just craps out and I have to crash and reopen the app to force it to reconnect to using Wi-Fi. On the Pixel, I don't have this problem. It just works. It just connects so much faster, hooking onto the Wi-Fi when it sees one that it can use. Over to the watch experience now. And I, I was kind of hoping that the, the Pixel watch would have launched and I'd be able to test all of this like Google ecosystem together. But it looks like we'll be lacing a little bit longer, maybe a couple of months more for the Pixel watch. But for now, the Galaxy Watch 4 and the whole kind of fitness thing. Now I know it's not really a Pixel thing, but I love how on the Galaxy Watch 4 will show you more stats like your average heart rate than what the Apple Watch does. This works really, really well for me with my Vitality Health Insurance, which gets me things like free Amazon Prime, a free Apple Watch, 20% off a Galaxy Watch 4, free cinema tickets, half price gym memberships, and just a ton of other stuff. And all I have to do is work out five times a week for 30 minutes and hit a certain average heart rate in those 30 minutes. Now, I think Vitality is like a UK only thing, but if you want to check it out, I'll link it down below. And if you sign up using that link, you also get £100 for using it as well. So uh, yeah, awesome. Now, anyway, with my Apple Watch and the whole like average heart rate thing, it's a guessing game. I can see my current heart rate whilst I'm working out, but I can only see the average for the whole session once I finish the workout, which is kind of too late at that point. Whereas on the Galaxy Watch 4, I can see that live whilst working out. And actually I can customize what I want to see depending on the type of workout that I'm doing. You know, If I'm swimming, maybe I want to see laps. If I'm running, maybe I want to see the average speed or hit workouts where I want to see more heart related information. Also, minor note here, but I decided to buy the cheapest model, which the smallest one, you know, the least capacity and just Wi-Fi only, not cellular. But I do think the next time I would get the cellular model, it's something that I did kind of miss from my Apple Watch because I did have that on there when I go for a run or a swim and just still being able to get my messages and calls. But I definitely, definitely liked having the smaller watch rather than the large one. I think I might actually swap my larger Apple Watch Series 7 for a smaller model now. And now let's talk about bugs because this has been such a big issue for me and I've mentioned it in pretty much all of my Pixel videos so far. And the good news is that for me, lots of the bugs have been fixed. I did get the December update, though I do believe Google stopped pushing that update out due to some other issues. But for me, most of the apps are now bug free. And actually, in fact, I don't think I can recall the last time I had an issue with the... Oh, no, no, no. So I woke up this morning and my phone was just switched off. Like, no alarm, just off. I had to actually power it back on again and it was sat on the charger all night. It was 100% battery, but it was off. So uh, yeah, there's that. But genuinely, I'm not seeing anywhere near the number of bugs that I was getting at launch. It's not been as bug free as I've come to expect on you know iOS, but it definitely has improved. And I guess that is where all of the good stuff stops for now. So I'm gonna call this part the minor annoyances part because honestly, there are no huge, like this is ridiculous kind of issues with this phone. It's a fantastic phone. So please be mindful that these are personal opinions. I'm not slating Android versus Apple be kind to each other in the comments below please ultimately people can choose whichever the phone they want so there are just my findings on the not so good stuff on the pixel 6 pro so first minor annoyance widgets on the home screen there are some widgets that just devour the available space that you have for no reason at all like the binance widget for example is a fixed five by three width even though when you actually place it on your home screen you can see it doesn't need anywhere near that much space. So there's a huge amount of wasted space above and below which could otherwise be used. Now the same can be said for the clock at the top. You could configure it so that all you need is the time here, but you still can't use any of the white space to the right of it. Because I guess the widget is configured so if you wanna show like calendar appointments or weather, then it might need that space. But if all you want is the date, then it still reserves the entire row. Now secondly, for minor annoyances, it's got to be said that the fingerprint reader. Now I know that people commented on my last video said that I wasn't pressing the fingerprint reader properly. Here is some footage of that thing that's probably most 
most frustrated me when using this phone. Because of the technology Google used in this phone and the way it like reads your fingerprint by shining this bright light onto your finger, it means that if your fingerprint is in any way not perfect, like say after you've been outside in the cold for a long time and your fingers go all like kind of hard or in a shower and they wrinkle up or if you have any water or specks of dirt or paints on your fingers for any reason, then it will either not work or be very, very slow to work. I've actually had to revert to using the pattern unlock to get into my phone more times than I would have thought so. Whereas on the iPhone, my Face ID experience has been really, really great. Like when I'm at home and getting into apps which are locked behind like Face ID, or even unlocking the phone itself, it's pretty flawless. It's also useful when you receive a notification while say, painting a room and you want to see what it is but without actually having to put everything down and pick up your phone to unlock it well with face id you can literally just hover over your phone and it will unlock and then show you those notifications now for those of you saying that fingerprint is still better when you're wearing a mask well for me it's not because i have an apple watch and the watch and the face kind of work seamlessly together when face id can't see your whole face it then checks that your watch is still there still on your wrist and it hasn't been taken off your wrist since the last time it checked and then unlocks your phone almost as quickly as it working kind of normally so fingerprint not so good even after the latest software update even with sensitivity turned up or down or whichever way you meant to do it and i'll also add here that android does have these handy features where you can have your phone unlocked when it's near other bluetooth devices like a watch for example but i have kids and yeah, not a good idea. So I generally keep my phone locked all of the time, no matter where I am. Now touching on voice, because where voice dictation is incredibly good, the call screening feature, which uses a mix of kind of Google services to screen calls and show you what the caller is saying on the screen before you actually pick up the call. Well, in my real world experience, most people just hung up and didn't actually say anything. I guess because they assumed it was voicemail rather than this voice digital assistant thing. And then we're on to battery life. Now battery life to me just isn't on par with the iPhone 13 Pro. Because I have kids, sometimes my days are very very long like 6 a.m to like 1 a.m type long now i know it's unusual for someone to expect to get 19 hours of usage from a phone and my old iphone 11 pro max used to struggle but it did get there but with the pixel i do find myself having to charge midday more than i used to you can string that out more with the battery saver mode and the extreme battery saver mode which switches off some of the features but as far as standard battery life goes i would say it's close but not as good as specifically the iphone 13 pro and then of course way off the mark with the iphone 13 pro max because that is just an absolute beast okay touching again on bugs because whilst this doesn't have any bugs that i've come across recently what i have noticed since moving to the google ecosystem is that there just aren't that many updates as you get on ios so for example let's look at the iphone ios 15 was launched on the 20th of september 2021 since then we've had an update basically every two weeks kind of maybe to a month so in three months since it was launched we've had five updates to ios 15 for like bug fixes and even some new features compare this to the Pixel, who launched the Pixel 6 late October, and then had to wait until December to get the one and only update that has been released for the Pixel, still to this day. Now that's not true with the apps themselves, though I am glad to see that they updated fairly often. But whilst I'm fortunate enough to receive this like December update, well, it's not very reassuring to see that for someone buying the phone now, there have been no further updates. And yes, there is a January update, but again, it's been delayed for the Pixel 6 and Pixel 6 Pro, so, who knows what's going on there? How about the Galaxy Watch 4? Well, given that this is using the Google Pixel 6 with a Samsung Galaxy Watch 4, I was kind of expecting there to be some things that wouldn't work well. And most things, to be fair, did. You just install the Samsung wearable app on the Pixel, connect the watch up and just most of the stuff works. But I did have issues with quite a few other things. Google services specifically, which I guess is to be expected. Google Fit just doesn't work. The workout just doesn't start and the screen just stays black. And then Google Pay, again, also just doesn't work on the watch, which is kind of annoying since those are both things that I would use every single day. So instead I've used the Samsung Fitness app, which again had that great level of customization that I mentioned earlier. And I had to use Google Pay on my phone instead, which which was fine. It's not a, you know, a huge issue. Like I said, there's no game changer issues here. So there are always workarounds. What I'm gonna do here now is because it's been three months with this phone, I'm actually gonna switch back to my iPhone. I've gotten so used to this Pixel that I've kind of forgotten what it's like to use an iPhone. My memory is like really bad. So I'm gonna try and swap back for a week, maybe two weeks, and just see if there's anything that jumps out at me now that I preferred on the Pixel than on the iPhone. So be sure to subscribe to the channel for that one. Otherwise, a fun game to play would be to go and watch my first ever flagship Android phone experience, which was when I reviewed the Samsung S21 Ultra. It's probably a bit cringy because it was my second Android phone that I ever reviewed. So go and watch that if you wanna laugh or perhaps go and watch my camera comparison between the iPhone, the S21, and the Pixel 6. And I'll see you in the next video. Cheers, bye-bye.